go ahead and change the slide, Julie. So thank you everyone so much for joining us. You're happy, we're so happy you're here. Welcome to Community Connection Hour, an hour long community program on Zoom about resources and organizations available to SJPL patrons. Today's special guests are from Project Sentinel and we will be discussing California's COVID-19 rent relief program. We ask that you hold your questions until the end um, as we will have a designated time to uh, answer questions, to only answer questions. Thanks Mercedes and thanks everyone for having us here today. Um, we will have a pretty comprehensive um, um, slideshow about you know the different COVID-19 uh, points and then um, we'll cover some relevant San Jose ordinances and state statutes. Can everyone confirm you could see my screen? Okay. Okay, so um, as a uh, Project Sentinel, um, we are a nonprofit organization that assists um, small cities, um, uh, city specific and county specific regions in Northern California. And we help tenants and landlords primarily with the state's rent relief program. Um, but we do provide referrals to the local Santa Clara County um, rent relief program, also known as the Homelessness Prevention System. We'll go over an in-depth walkthrough of the state program. Um, we'll only be going through the tenant application only, but this may be helpful for landlords to understand the steps required of their tenants. We'll also cover general requirements of both tenants and landlords under AB 832 and the state's rent relief program. And as introduced by the San Jose Public Library staff, um, we are um, a neutral landlord tenant um, counseling agency and uh, dispute resolutions is one of our core services. This includes supporting some cities with administration of the rent stabilization and hearing and petition processes, as well as mediation and conciliation. Um, here to present today is Esenia Macias. Um, she's a case manager with Project Sentinel and myself, Joanne Pham, I'm a rent stabilization analyst. So now I'll hand it off to Asenia, who will go over relevant San Jose ordinances and AB 1482. Thank you, Joanne. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today. Um, so we're gonna discuss um, San Jose ordinances, two of them, the apartment rent ordinance, as well as the tenant protection ordinance, which are just for the city of San Jose, as well as AB 1482, and it's also known as the Tenant Protection Act. Um, next slide, please. So in San Jose, there's um, two ordinances. Uh, the ARO basically is rent control to certain units within San Jose. Um, the TPO provides eviction protections and requires a just cause reason. And so um, the ARO has been in effect since September 7th. 1979, so quite some time. And the TRO is fairly new. It's been in effect since June 16th, 2017. So the two, um, the two differences between them is the ARO strictly covers rent controlled units. So those units are gonna be, and we'll get into um, what, what units are covered, um, but those are gonna strictly be um, units that basically the city manages where landlords are required to register their units with the city. Um, and there's um, some protections in there in terms of how much the rent can be increased as well as relocation and so forth. Um, the TPO is very specific. It just provides eviction protections. So let, we'll get into detail as we go um, to the next slide, please, Joanne. So what does the ARO apply to? Um, it applies to apartment buildings with three or more units built before 1979. Um, it applies to guest houses as well, built before 1979. Condo developments where there's three or more units owned by one owner. 
um, if there was less than three units, then the landlord would be exempt. And we'll go over that in the next couple of slides to come. Um, individual rents fully or partially paid by government. So section eight, um, they're also covered under the ARO. It does not apply to single family homes or condominiums. Um, as you will see above, what it applies to is only if the three condos are owned by one individual owner. Next slide, please. So I know this can be very hard to remember and extremely confusing for some people. And the best resource is, which I use myself, is on the city of San Jose's website, there um, is a tool that they have, and I'll put it in the chat in just a second. Um, but what you're able to do is enter your address here, and it will tell you if your unit is covered or not. Um, you can also contact the city to get more information, whether if you know the landlord's registered or not. Um, one of the requirements is that the landlord should be educating tenants if they're covered or exempt and providing the information. Another key point to note is that these, um, the information on the ARO and or TPO should also be posted up in common areas of the complex so people are fully aware of their rights. Next slide, please. So the protections under the apartment rent ordinance rent increase limit of 5%. Um, and that's once in a 12 month period. Um, there are certain fees prohibited, for example, increases for tenants who have dependent children, foster children, spouse storage and or pet rent. Um, Anti-retaliation for exercise of rights under the ARO um, so landlords are prohibited from retaliatory conduct, like threatening tenants or attempting to, um, you know, terminate their tenancy or maybe increasing their rent um, or even threatening to report them to immigration. Another one that's not listed here that um, sometimes we see is uh, landlords will actually put a clause in the lease stating you are waiving your rights. That's not correct. Just if a tenant signed, that technically wouldn't mean that that supersedes law. Um, it would still be in effect and, you know, the tenant would have every right to go to the city of San Jose to get more information on how to petition. Okay, next slide, please. So the tenant protection ordinance is a little bit different. Um, it applies to rent controlled units, as I mentioned before, um, built before 1979, but it also applies to guest rooms in any guest house or unpermitted units. So a converted garage, for example, um, or any rental units in a multiple dwelling with three or more units. So a triplex or any a complex that has more than three units. It does not apply to duplexes, single family homes, and second units. So like an in-law, for example, or an ADU, like a cottage that's um, attached or detached, but on the same property. It also doesn't apply um, to government or subsidized units. So for people on section eight or who have moved to work vouchers, this TPL does not apply to them. It would only be covered by the apartment rent ordinance. And of course, it doesn't apply to hotels and motels. Next slide, please. Um, so the tenant protection under the TPO, um, just cause protection means that they need to provide you with a just cause reason. So you've got reasons that could be your fault, for example, which right now we have a moratorium, so non-payment of rent wouldn't be one right now, but violating the lease or criminal activity or refusing access to the unit for a landlord, for example, to make repairs to keep the unit habitable or um, you know, substantial damage to the unit or refusing to sign an identical lease 
or an unapproved subtenant. So if someone's subletting, for example. No fault evictions means something that the tenant has not done wrong. So tenant has not done anything wrong. Um, so re rehabilitation of the unit, um, the Ellis Act, which um, is basically a landlord removing the property from the rental market, or if the landlord intends on moving in, um, or if, for example, code enforcement has issued orders to vacate, or if it's an unpermitted unit that needs to be vacated. Um, so anti-retaliation for exercise under the TPO, landlords are prohibited from retaliatory conduct, such as threatening eviction, attempting to cause involuntary termination of the tenancy by reducing services. That can be either shutting off their PG&E or um, you know, turning off a service or reducing it um, from the time the tenant moved in, which was probably negotiated in the lease when they first moved in, or a rent increase or again, you know, reporting the tenant to immigration. The most important thing to note too is that there is relocation assistance um, under the TPO. And so there's three types of assistance. You got the base assistance, which is for all tenant households. Now, qualified assistance is gonna be for households um, with minor children, elderly persons, or people who are disabled or terminally ill. And then you got special assistance, um, which is in lieu of base assistance and qualified assistance. So basically the owner may offer to relocate the tenant household to another um, rent stabilized unit. So another unit that's still um, protected under these ordinances. Next slide, please. So um, just cause protections, um, AB 1482 is different from what we, I just went over um, because those two are, again, just for the city of San Jose. AB 1482 is a state law. So it applies to all California tenants, but every case is gonna be different. It only applies to specific units. So um, in order for someone to be covered, the tenant, at least one tenant, or if they move somebody else in, they would have to be living there at least or more than 12 months. Um, or say a tenant moved in, their partner, um, their partner would now need to have been there 12 months along with them. So a total of 24 months to be covered. So this day law only applies to certain units. Um, Besides the 12 month requirement, um, it applies to um, single family homes that are corporately owned. It applies to um, duplexes that are not owner occupied. Um, and then it applies to um, units where there's three or more units in a complex. So what it doesn't apply to, hotels, motels, hostels, dormitories, care facilities, um, again, people on section eight or who live in BMR units or um, um, have vouchers, they would be exempt from this state law. Um, another thing to note is if the building um, is less than 15 years old of being built, they're not covered. Um, and then owner occupied properties where no more than two tenants reside. Um, next slide, please. So I know that this is a, an overload of information, but the best resources I have listed here for you um, at Project Sentinel, we are contracted with the city of San Jose to service and provide a landlord helpline. So for San Jose tenants, they first must reach out to BALA, Bay Area Legal Aid. 
um, if they're not able to receive services from Bay Area Legal Aid, they should reach out to Law Foundation. And the numbers are listed here so you can write them down and keep them as a resource. And then of course our um, landlord helpline and the numbers listed here. So if you're not sure if you um, qualify, if you're covered or exempt from these ordinances, one of these three agencies listed here, including ours, can definitely provide information or going to the city website and entering your address or calling. Next slide, please. So does anyone have questions on what I just presented? I have a quick question. Sure. Um, so you said that the landlords are not allowed to call immigration under the TPO. Um, what happens if they do, even though they're not allowed to? Can Will immigration decline to come or what rights do, does the tenant then have? Um, so when it comes to immigration, that's going to be more of a fair housing question because it could be some sort of either retaliatory action or discrimination on the landlord's part. So Project Sentinel has a fair housing department. And so if the tenant were to reach out for that particular question, we can route them to our fair housing hotline or get them to the right agency. I know Law Foundation is a good resource. Okay, next slide, please. So now we're gonna discuss um, the COVID-19 rent relief, um, the Santa Clara County versus the state. So in Santa Clara County, um, there's a, basically there's a local program in which tenants um, can apply to. Um, and to figure out which one they're eligible for, we have a chart here. So basically tenants who are earning um, Basically, the local program that administers the rent relief for tenants whose household income is below the 30%. So if you see the chart here, you want to um, determine first your household size and then figure out, okay, what income bracket am I in? And down below, you'll see here that, for example, a family of four with an income less than 49700 just an example should be applying through um, the Santa Clara County program. If your household is over the limits for the local program, then you would want to apply through the state program, which is that housingiskey.com website that you've probably all been hearing about. Um, so this is kind of the chart. If you need help figuring out what what program you must apply to, feel free to reach out to us by email at erap at housing.org, erap at housing.org. Um, if you're unsure um, where to apply, we can guide you. Um, or we can send a referral on your behalf to the local program and make sure that someone does contact you. Next slide, please. Okay, so the Santa Clara County Homelessness Prevention System. Um, this is, again, through the local um, program. And um, there are more than 40 local partners in the Homelessness Prevention System network who can assist in a multitude of language options. Um, this program serves extremely low income tenants residing in Santa Clara County. So if you're not a San Jose tenant, but you are a tenant in Santa Clara, call Project Sentinel and we can help um, refer you and get you the resources that you need so you know where to apply. Um, landlords do not, do not need to submit an application if their tenant's eligible for the local program. Um, it provides rental, utilities, and additional wraparound services. There's also case management support and um, additional funds available for those not eligible for the state program. Um, our knowledge is very limited. 
um, with the local program and we know a little bit more about the state because each um, local partner um, has their own eligibility criteria. So it's best to ask them directly. Next slide, please. May, may I ask a question or do you want me to wait? You can ask a question, that's fine, thank you. Okay, um, so in the library, you know, there's 20, I think 25 or 26 branches within our library system. And uh, I know our branch and other branches more than others tend to have um, uh, um, persons who may be without housing, right? And they might come in and ask for resources or they might be someone that each morning we greet because that's where they stay, right? Um, until the library opens. What resources would be the best to give to them? In terms of looking for housing? Yeah, or just ha having a place to stay instead of the street. Um, well, from personal knowledge, I can say if there is a family or individual who's receiving, um, for example, government assistance, there are rapid rehousing programs through social services, but people need to be engaged. They need to submit the required documentation that the county requests. Um, I know some folks may not have a steady phone where they can be reached, um, but being able to um, have, for example, a caseworker at an agency help you navigate and be uh, of help, whether it's using their email or receiving a message for you or helping you scan in your documents, um, they would definitely reach need to reach out to um, based on their need. Okay. Um, they can also go to the Housing Authority's website, and I know that um, not sure for Santa Clara County, but sometimes things open up, you know, interest lists, there's flyers all the time. Yeah. There's new projects. So people need to be a little bit more proactive or ask questions. Okay. Um, at Project Sentinel, we usually refer people to other agencies if they're looking for affordable housing um, because we're neutral and we don't provide any affordable housing or financial assistance. Got it. Thank you. I also want to add that we are going to get into it on this slide, but a lot of the um, network partners that assist with the Santa Clara County program assist directly in Santa Clara County with homelessness. And so they have their own homeless shelters. Um, as one of the entities that helps refer to all of these um, organizations in the homelessness prevention system, we do have, you know, a, a form that when we help with referrals, it automatically disseminates to all of these potential organizations. So if anyone is in need, they can go through us. But um, I was going to add that, um, you know, one of the great things about this program now, which we'll go into more detail later, is that you can qualify for rental, rental assistance or use these funds for hotel and motel stays um, if you've already been temporarily displaced and are, and are homeless. Um, so we'll get into more detail about that later. Thanks, Asenia. Thank you, Joanne. So Thank on this you. slide here, um, it's just assistance with the Santa Clara County application. So for people who are um, eligible for the local program who have language barriers. It's color, it's a color-coded key here. And these are all the agencies um, that offer different language assistance in different languages. And I seen in the chat, somebody asked if they can get a phone number. And so we're gonna be providing um, the staff from the library with uh, a copy of this presentation and all the phone numbers are listed. So, um, you know, if you're not able to keep up taking notes, you will get a copy of this. All right, I'm gonna um, uh, turn it over to Joanne now so she can continue. Hi everyone, and just before I move on um, to the next section, I do want to add that um, in our referral form, there is, um, you know, we are asked whether or not the applicant has been in the Homelessness Management Information System, HMIS, which is one of the systems that Life Moves, Home First, and a lot of different homeless shelters use to 
um, try and prioritize those who have been in that system for a long time. So if someone you're helping is not already in that system, you can actually update that system um, by helping them get into touch with get in touch with Home First, Life Moves, um, a, a host of other um, homeless shelters that exist in Santa Clara County. Um, so now we're gonna go into AB 832, the most recent COVID-19 um, Tenant Relief Act and the eligibility criteria for rent relief. Um, so AB 832, um, as you know, was signed by the governor into law on June 28th, thereby extending eviction protections for tenants to September 30th, 2021. Um, it provides the standards for distrib distribution of the funds enacted by the American Rescue Plan Act, including funds that will be used for rent relief in this new phase of funds under AB 832. Um, so AB 832 also provides temporary eviction procedures to begin on October 1st, 2021. Um, so in order to maintain eviction protections, um, that the ones that are extended to September 30th, the tenant must sign and serve a declaration of COVID-19 related financial distress to their landlord and pay at least 25% of rent owed between September 1st, 2020 and September 30th, 2021, by September 30th, 2021. Um, you do not have to serve a signed declaration on a monthly basis unless the landlord serves you a 15 day notice to pay or quit with a blank declaration on a monthly basis. So I've hyperlinked where you can find that declaration in this slide and all of you will be able to get a copy of these slides after our presentation. It takes you to a housingiskey.com website um, where there are tenant eviction protection forms. Um, on the second page of that form, there are instructions for how you can serve this on your landlord. Um, second, in terms of that 25% uh, rule, um, you can pay this 25% portion as a lump sum instead of paying 25% of the monthly rent on a monthly basis. That means if you've already been current on rent from September 2020 to December 2020, for example, you've already exceeded the requirement to pay 25% of rent owed. So essentially, you only need to pay 3.25 months out of that 13 month period, and you are now covered. For those tenants who have unpaid rent that accrued between March 1st, 2020 through August 31st, 2020, you can never be evicted for unpaid rent. So that is called the protected period. And if you have already, you know, if you have unpaid rent during that time, but you've saved some money to pay for rent, you should definitely prioritize payment of rent for that September 1st, 2020 period through September 30th, 30th, 2021. In terms of the temporary eviction procedures starting October 1st, 2021, there is a new notice that landlords must serve their tenants who have unpaid rent accrued on or after July 1st, 2021. And again, we've hyperlinked that here in our slides, so you can um, uh, locate that once you get a copy of our slides. Um, tenants will have the opportunity to apply for rent relief um, if they are served with an unlawful detainer action, otherwise known as an eviction lawsuit. But you will have a deadline to submit a complete application if you are served with an eviction lawsuit. Um, the deadline would be 15 days. Um, so the landlord in this case will have to submit their own application for rent relief in order to even file an eviction lawsuit and have their summons and complaint issued. However, the tenant will have only 15 calendar days to complete their application and submit it to the state. So although eviction procedures will not start until October 1st, 2021, the first day a lawsuit can be filed is October 1st, 2021. So I would say beginning in September, it's re recommended that tenants submit their applications within this 15 day time limit. Um, if you are not in, you know, great communications with your landlord. Um, just know that when the landlord submits an application to the state, you will be notified either by phone or by email 
by email would be the fastest way. However, if your landlord did not include your email information, you may not have received that. So it's always good to try and be in touch and, you know, have a try and try your best to have a cooperative nature with your landlord. So these are the forms that I talked about um, in the last slide. The first one being the declaration of COVID-19 related financial distress. Um, this is a declaration signed under penalty of perjury, meaning that you attest that this is true and accurate. Um, so we recommend that you read the document carefully to make sure um, one of those six uh, points apply to you. Um, so the sixth point you can see just says other circumstances. So there may be unique circumstances where um, COVID-19 has impacted your finances, either by incurring significant costs or by having your income reduced. So um, uh, finally, that last paragraph on the declaration says that no amount of public assistance is able to um, recover your loss of expenses. So uh, your loss or increase of expenses. So um, once you sign and date that on the second page, as I said, is instructions for how you can serve a signed copy on your landlord. And typically the methods include however your landlord accepts rent from you, which usually includes a mailed check. You can mail this copy to your landlord or if they accept it in person, you can serve this um, in person to them. And so the second notice on this page says, Notice from the State of California Code of Civil Procedures Section 1179.04C. I'm sorry that this doesn't have a better name and it's not easy to say. However, this is the notice that's required by landlords in order to notify any tenants who have unpaid rent between March 1st, 2020 through September 30th, 2021 that rent relief exists and that they have protections that they can take advantage of. Landlords must serve this notice, otherwise they will not be able to serve a 15-day notice on their tenants. Um, so if you are served with a 15-day notice to pay or quit as a tenant, but you have never seen this notice pursuant to Code of Civil Procedure 1179.04C, and you had rent that was owed on or after July 1st, then that notice may not be sufficient. The notice, the 15-day notice, I mean. Um, but uh, for those landlords who have not yet served this, um, you might see somewhere on this form or this notice that it says it must be served by July, 31st, uh, July 31st, 2021. However, you can still serve this notice after July 30th if you don't make that deadline. Um, we've always encouraged that, um, that you serve it late, better late than never. We are unaware of any um, of any, I guess, penalties for late service. Um, however, the, the only penalty we're aware is that you cannot serve a 15-day notice without serving this, this notice pursuant to the Code of Civil Procedure. Um, so just to let you all know, it, we've linked uh, the locations of these forms at the bottom of the page, and there are multiple language options, including Spanish, Mandarin, Tagalog, Vietnamese, and Korean. So who qualifies for rent relief? Um, Low-income households earning at or below 80% of area median income. Um, and only one adult in each household must be impacted by COVID in some way. Um, what is covered under the California COVID-19 rent relief program? Under AB 832, all tenants and landlords are now all who are eligible can now receive 100% of unpaid rent, 100% of future rent, and 100% of past and current utility bills. So um, previous language you might have seen says that you can receive future utility bills. However, the way that they've set up the application now is that you can only request current utility bills and past utility bills since they do need to um, have an actual invoice, which we'll go into more detail later. Um, in terms of other housing related expenses. This is what we kind of covered when we discussed homelessness and the homelessness prevention system. Um, so other housing related expenses can include relocation costs such as security deposit costs for your new unit, um, hotel and motel stays for being temporarily displaced, as well as um, 
application fees to be screened for a new apartment and other miscellaneous um, fees or expenses that can be covered under other housing related expenses. So just to go into a little bit more detail about what area median income is, um, it is determined by your household size, as well as the income earned by all adult members in that in that household. So a household means everyone who lives in the home, including children, even if you're not related, um, if you're on the same lease as each other, and if you do not have a division of income, like you don't have a division in how you spend your income. Um, so if you're um, a, with a significant other and you're kind of a domesticated household, then um, I would consider that a full household. However, there are certain exceptions now, which we'll go into more detail soon. Um, income, uh, the total earnings of all adults only. If there are any minors who are working part-time jobs, their income does not count. Um, once you go into the number of people in your household, let's say there's, you know, one adult and one child living together, um, then you would go down the list to see if your income is at or below these limits. So as you can see with my mouse, if you are a two person household, and the only person making income has income below $39,000, $39,800, then they would apply with the Santa Clara County program. If you make more than that amount, then you would be able to apply for the state program. Um, and just to be clear, the state program will reject any applicants who um, accidentally apply for the state program when their income is at or below this amount highlighted on, in orange here. So previously, there were a number of applicants that were not eligible for the state program. Um, for example, subtenants um, did not qualify since they did not have a direct lease with the, with the landlord. Um, subtenants may now qualify if they meet the income requirements for the, for the program by themselves. Um, however, this does require a written agreement with, between the subtenant and sublessor. Um, this can even be currently dated. For co-tenants, co-tenants um, are those who live with a, with a lot of other roommates, for example. Um, co-tenants previously did not qualify um, if their combined income with the other leaseholders was over the 80% area median income amount. So now if they can provide proof that their individual income is separate from their roommates, then they can qualify for rent relief. And all they would need to provide is either a tax return, public assistance program documentation, or a written agreement separating the co-tenants and other leaseholders obligations. And this can be currently dated as well. So you could sign it tomorrow, but all, all the other leaseholders have to have signed it as well as yourself. And then finally, self-evicted tenants. Previously, those who had already moved out of their unit could not request rent relief for the place that they moved out of, but still owed rent. Now, tenants who no longer live in the unit can apply for rent relief towards that property, but the landlord and tenant must both apply in that situation. And then they can only apply for back rent owed sometime between April 1st, 2020 and September 30th, 2021. No future rent is allowed to be requested because it's you know, um, it's believed that you've already moved out. So future rent would not be possible. And then finally, there's other issues for applicants that are now cured, such as those whose leases included a co-signer. Previously, some applicants had issues applying because their co-signer made a lot of money. And so they were automatically disqualified based on that co-signer's income. But now that can be remedied if the co-signer um, attests or the renter can provide a tax return or other public assistance program documentation. Um, but the co-signer can now attest to state that their um, co-signing on the lease was only to support the applicant's credit and is not, um, and they are not a member of the applicant's direct household. And then finally, 
there are two um, less documents that some tenants will not have to upload to the program, including your proof of identity if you've submitted income verification documents such as two most recent pay stubs. Um, and then you can also um, waive uh, any upload of your proof of identity if you've requested utilities assistance and your utility bills are in your name. And I just wanted to emphasize that immigration status is never a factor in either the state or the Santa Clara County programs. Um, and then finally for proof of residence, meaning just proof that you live in the property, tenants do not have to provide a lease or rental agreement if their landlord intends to apply. So if you've already talked to your landlord and you know that they've either one, already submitted an application or two, plan to submit an application, then you can um, click that you know that they intend to apply and you don't have to include a lease or rental agreement. And if any of your proposed proofs of identity or proofs of residence are kind of out of the ordinary, you can always reach out to our office at erap at housing.org and we can help you come up with alternative documents that are definitely approved under the program. So what do tenants need to apply? Um, for tenants and landlords, you both do need an email address. You'll need income information such as your 2020 tax return, W-2, 1099, um, bank statements um, are one way to show income if you have an unusual form of, of income and you don't have the any official documentation. There are also ways to certify zero income or cash income, meaning um, you don't have to upload any official documentation. You can simply attest and declare that you do not have um, any documentation for support and that you receive income this way or you do not have any income. Finally, um, you'll need utility bills if you're requesting utilities, identification, as I said, if no utilities are requested and you don't have income documents. Um, landlord or property manager's contact information, you only need to provide their phone number or their email or their address. Only one form of contact information is needed. For rent amounts, you need to know your um, specific rent amounts that you still owe per month since April, 2020. And then you need to also know whether or not you received assistance previously during April 2020 to present. And you will also need a copy of your lease or rental contract if your landlord is not applying. And then for landlords, it's a much smaller list. They will also need an email address to apply. They will need their, co their tenant's contact information, either an email, you will need all of the information, I'm sorry an email, phone number, and address. Um, you will need to list your own landlord or property manager contact information. You will need to know the total rent amounts owed by the tenant or tenants since April, 2020. You will need your lease and rental contract. And although it's not required to be uploaded in the application any longer, landlords will need to have available their proof of ownership or authorization of their property manager to lease units. And something new that we actually learned today is if the tenant does not have an email address or the landlord does not know the tenant's email address, they can use the state's call center email, which is um, support at ca-rentrelief.com. I'll put it in the chat soon um, to initiate a support ticket to assist the case manager in connecting your application with your tenants. Um, if you use your own email address or a false one, your application may be flagged and delayed. So some tips on applying for the state program. Um, as we stated, an email address is unfortunately required. We encourage landlords and tenants to inform each other if they are initiating an application and provide each other's case ID numbers where possible. Um, just note, as especially for those who are not technologically proficient, emails regarding the application will come from neighborly software. And you know that's not immediately obvious that that's related to the COVID-19 rent relief programs, but that is the software program that was contracted with the state in order to 
create their portal online. So if you see an email from Neighborly Software, it may be important. Um, we also encourage landlords and tenants to, you know, cooperate with each other throughout the application process. For those who are not comfortable starting the process on their computers, there is an opportunity to start at least the eligibility portion through text message. You would have to text rent to 211211. Um, there's also soon to be a text document upload option that will become available from the state for those who do not have a way to easily upload their documents. Um, this text document upload option will essentially allow you to take a photo with your phone and then send it via text to a designated number and then it will be sent directly to the state. No one else will see it, but you will need your case ID number. Um, and just to let everyone know, although this rent text to 211211 option is available in multiple language options, the word rent must be texted in English. And then finally in this section, we'll just cover um, briefly how payments are administered. So um, first, tenants will still receive 100% of rent and utilities assistance if the state determines the landlord is not participating. Um, landlords are still encouraged to apply because this speeds up the process for payment and landlords can be paid directly. If tenants receive payment directly, they must forward the payment to the landlord within 15 business days. So only the weekdays or the non-holidays. Um, and uh, payments are not made on a first come first serve basis. The most vulnerable tenants are paid first. So if you've been waiting for a long time, you know, this, may, this might be the reason. Tenants whose household income are at or below 30% area median income and tenants who have been unemployed the past 90 consecutive days are prioritized first. And then finally, applicants who already received payment before AB 832 passed will still get 100% of what they requested. They will be paid the difference to total 100% and payment will be sent to the same person who was already paid. So under the previous program, tenants whose landlords did not seem to want to participate received 25%. So now they will be sent directly with 75% the difference. Um, landlords who were paid the 80% because they agreed to waive 20% will now be sent the 20% remainder. And finally, I just wanted to pause for questions here to see if I think I see some questions in the chat. Okay, I see um, a slide request. Um, does anyone have any questions? You can put it in the in the chat or you can try and raise your hand if you're not comfortable with using the chat and I can try and unmute you. Um, first of all, this is probably one of the best resource presentations I've ever been to. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, yes, for sharing this because the FOCs on the call today are definitely going to, to spread this. Um, but I can also see this presentation being valid for other librarians and staff who work with patrons every day. So uh, we'll get in touch with you about, or I'll get in touch with Mercedes about maybe you speaking at one of our librarians meeting one time. But my question is, um, <clears throat> once the library begins to open or even tabling right now, which we do outdoors, is there anyone available who could ever just be out there sharing this resource? Is that something that someone from your office would offer? So there are actually a growing number of pop-up uh, uh, pop up locations where people are okay. helping um, in person with their applications. Um, there are some that are held by Catholic Charities and they actually administer both the Santa Clara County local program as well as the state program applications. Um, in, let me let me try and think. I think there are going to be more than that, more than just Catholic Charities as well. But I can share a flyer after this. Awesome. Um, they do have um, on a regular this pop up locations for people to apply. Perfect. Thank you. No problem. Well, I have a question. Um, is this 
of the COVID-19 re relief, rent relief payment rent relief program, is it considered a public benefit? A public benefit as in, do you mean it counts as income or? Um, a public benefit, uh, so I know a lot of people <clears throat> in the uh, Im immigrant community don't like applying for things like this because if they ever do go to um, apply for citizenship or something like that, it would be counted against them. Right, so I do know that um, I researched this briefly and I'm by no means an expert on the topic, but I believe it does not interfere with the citizenship process. I forgot the term exactly for it, but um, there is an organization where I could send their FAQ sheet and this was regarding the ERAP one phase, but I believe it would apply to the ERAP two phase as well. All right, so thank you for your questions. I will now turn it over to Yesenia, who will cover the process for starting a new application. Yeah, thank you, Joanne. Okay. Are you guys able to see the screen still where it says COVID rent relief, starting new application? Okay, great. So that's what we're gonna discuss now. Can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so um, the, again, this is the state application at housingiskey.com. So if you're wanting to apply for rent relief, um, you're going to click on where it says apply now. Next slide, please. So um, you, there's a questionnaire that um, tenants can um, fill out. Um, and so if they've already started an application, there's a link below where they can continue um, or they can start a new application where it says apply now. Next slide, please. And so when you get to the state website and you go to up, when you click apply now, it's going to lead you to this jurisdiction map. And so basically um, what you can do is type in an address. So for example, we have Mountain View, California. And then um, the applicant, if you see here on the, the second arrow below, um, it says apply to the state link to program and application. So it's gonna map out what program you're eligible for, eligible for excuse me, based on your address. Um, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think I heard today in one of our other meetings that um, as, you know, the resources are used, these are gonna phase out eventually to be for the state program, but as things progress and as information becomes available, um, you know, we'll update it accordingly. Um, next slide, please. So actually, can you take me back to um, where it says apply now? I just wanna go over one thing that I forgot to mention. Um, the application is available in many other languages. So um, you can, there is the opportunity to select your preferred language. Um, as you can see here, there's um, at the top where it says California COVID rent relief, the orange ones for Spanish, and then you have Chinese and so forth. So the application is available for non-English speakers. Okay, now we can go to, um, Two slides after this one, please. Okay, so once you click, um, once you type in your address and you click on continue, it's going to lead you to an eligibility questionnaire. And so this is the actual application questionnaire and it says, are you a landlord or tenant? And you click what applies to you. This is the first question. Next slide, please. And then the second question is, are you a member of one of the following tribes? And you would go ahead and select um, the option that applies to you. It's a yes or no. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so the income limit in this question will change based on the number of household members. So you want to make sure that um, you put in the property county, so Santa Clara County. And 
An example would be four household members. So the limit would be 117,750. So if your income's below that, you would qualify. You would click yes. If it is not, you obviously would click no. Okay, so um, the income limit in this question is based on the number again of household members like in the previous one. But this now um, ask if the 30% income limit for Santa Clara County. So if they're above or below and then you know choose the option that best suits your, um, your answer if it's a yes or no question. So if the tenant's income, if the tenant's household income um, is below the 30%, you will be directed to um, the program administered by the County of Santa Clara Homelessness Prevention System. The local program will cover the same amounts as the state program and will seek out additional support for the tenant to ensure housing stability. Um, I know earlier someone asked the question about um, people who are currently homeless. So again, this can be um, done using the local partner. And um, you know, if you're not sure, you can refer them over so we can send a referral on their behalf. Um, here it says, based on your responses, you live in a jurisdiction where your local program is administering their own rent relief funds for the income you have identified please apply to your local program. Again, if you're below the 30% and you apply to the state, your application will be denied as Joanne mentioned earlier. Next slide. Okay. Um, question number four on the questionnaire asks, have you or anyone in your household qualified for unemployment benefits? experienced a reduction in income or experienced other financial hardships due to COVID. If you say no, it's going to say you're not eligible. So if you have been impacted by COVID or have experienced a financial hardship, choose the option that best suits you. Okay, next slide. Question number five, do you have a past due rent notice and eviction notice can demonstrate housing instability or risk of homelessness, past due utilities or need assistance paying future rent or utilities and choose the option that best suits your situation. And the next slide. Okay, so determining eligibility. So um, here, based on us answering the questions that we were impacted by COVID, we're below the 30%. Um, it says you may qualify for the California COVID-19 rent relief program. Please proceed to the application. Before applying, you will need one of the following. Um, so here's a checklist of all the forms. I know we're short on time, so I'm not gonna go through each one, but um, you will receive a copy of this presentation. And, um, Verify residency, there's um, you know, a list of one of the following, you only need one. Um, and then verifying the ownership and then the rent owed. Um, so for landlords, either a property deed, mortgage note, property tax form or home insurance. And then you can proceed with applying at the um, blue button below where it says apply now. So this is just a, um, an exact image of how the questionnaire questions are um, prior to filling out the application for the state. And um, so the next slide. <clears throat> so this we're going to cover now um, just the rent relief application process. Next slide. So this is the housing is key website. If you click on apply now, it's going to lead you to this page. And so um, you will need an email to register and create an account on the state's website. And so to register, you would just simply enter your email address 
And again, this there's many other op, um, language options in which you can fill this out. So for non-English speakers, they, this is available for them. Um, so you will need your email address, um, your first last name, and a password. The password's tricky. You, it will need to be um, 12 characters long, at least one capital letter, and one special character, so a symbol. Um, and it's important to write this down so that way, um, you know, whoever's filling out an application can just go back in and gain access and check the status of it. If they've already created an account, you would just simply click on the sign in part next to where it says register and um, just sign in if you've already created one. Next slide. So, um, this is uh, an example of uh, what um, it will look like once you've created an account. So on the left side here, you can see um, there's a case ID. So the first um, little circle at the top left here, we're near the arrow right below. Um, and we use our names as an example, but it will sign you a case ID number. That's really important because um, you know, the landlord will need it or vice versa, you will need to provide it to the landlord. Um, and then it will tell you the name of the application. And um, I think the most important thing would be the status. So application in progress, for example. Um, every time you fill out a section on the application, always at the bottom of the page, click save so you don't lose what you've already filled out. At the top right corner where the arrow is pointing, you will see um, an existing application and it says in progress. So even though we assist people with filling out their application, once we've done that and assisted with, for example, uploading documents for the person, um, once they submit their application, we won't know the status. Um, they can either log in and see the status here, or they can call the state's phone number, which we'll provide in the end of the presentation. Um, and the state also has a, um, an email address as well. And their call center is open seven days a week. Um, I think it's from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So, you know, there any times pretty much good to call throughout the day. Um, if you need to start a new application, you would just simply click here to start a new application. And so I know this can be very confusing, but there are going to be scenarios where you have a master tenant who's applied for rent relief for themselves as a tenant for their landlord. But then you'll also see a scenario where they've also applied as a landlord because they have subtenants who have not paid them rent. So it's very important to pay attention to the case ID. Um, and if it's for themselves or for their subtenants and to check the status either here or um, contacting the state directly. So um, if there's things that need to be edited in the application, you can always go back to it as long as you saved it and log back in your account. I'm gonna hand it over to Joanne now to uh, cover the remaining part of the application for you guys. Hi everyone. So, um, this portion of the application is um, relevant to both landlords and tenants, um, but what you see here is more so the tenant application. Um, if you want uh, someone you trust to be able to access and receive emails about your application and you are not completely comfortable being independent with this online process, there is a way to um, allow someone, which is by clicking this view users button in the top left corner when you enter your application and then clicking um, add a user. And once you type in their email address and click add, they will receive an invitation to access your application. Um, note, they will be able to see everything in your application and even sign on your behalf. So please make sure you really trust this person and that 
or maybe even if it's someone in a nonprofit organization who's partnered with the state like ourselves, um, once you add that person, they'll be able to do and see everything in your application. Um, So these are the different application sections that are available in the tenant application. Um, we always you know, want to remind you all to please click save or complete and continue on each page before changing sections. Um, as you can see, there are about 11 sections alone for tenants to do, which is very different from the landlord application. The landlord application has only two substantive uh, sections. So it's much faster for a landlord to apply. So the revisions to this uh, application actually launched on June 4th and the same number of sections exist, but the sections have now been reorganized to move the requests for rental assistance earlier on and pushing the household number and income sections later to minimize the amount of documents you'll need to add. Okay, so um, section A is a little bit redundant. It's about eligibility again, and has similar questions as the ones in the eligibility questionnaire. But this is just to ensure that applicants make doubly sure that they qualify for the state application. Question A2 provides figures that are relevant to the 2021 area median media income limits. However, um, we do suggest either using your 2020 income or your current monthly income um, as methods to prove your um, eligibility for this program. Um, there is one other method which we'll go into later. Um, the stop sign here that you see in the middle of the page means that the tenant may not be eligible for the state's rent relief application. And if that's the case, you would need to read in greater detail that section here. So um, in terms of Santa Clara County residents specifically, question A3, um, as we said with the stop sign, indicates that extremely low income residents must go to the local program. And that's what we were discussing earlier, that if you are at or below 30% area median income, that means you are extremely low income and must apply to the Santa Clara County Homelessness Prevention System. And so it would redirect you here. However, what we do want to note is that on this eligibility section of the state application, it does not provide you this chart to let you know how to calculate whether or not you're extremely low income. So we provided that here on this slide so that you can tell for yourselves. Section B of the application um, has uh, just requests for your information. Um, however, it does open up um, there's new uh, sections that you're allowed to note for yourself now. Um, so section B5, for example, or question B5, um, has a variety of property types and situations that are eligible to apply. Um, it even has this note, I no longer live at the unit where I am requesting assistance. Question B6 now um, allows you to state if you're a, sub, uh, a subletter. And then question B13, um, applicants can identify a representative to receive emails and updates about your application. And this is similar to adding someone under the view user section. However, if you add their full information here under B13, they'll also be able to call into the call center on your behalf. And you may even receive calls from the call center on the applicant's behalf. Um, and one thing as you go through the application, um, hovering over this question mark symbol actually provides these pop-ups, such as this black box here, and allows you to see what they recommend that you um, input for your application. Section C of the application goes over how you are impacted by COVID-19. So there are options for how you had reduced income as a result of COVID-19 or how you incurred significant costs. Um, a new option has been added under the incurred significant cost section, um, namely whether you have child or adult dependent care expenses that increase due to COVID-19. For example, if an adult child has moved back into your home because they have now become unemployed, you have now incurred significant costs because of your need to care for that dependent adult. 
Um, and now you can attest to your COVID-19 impact by simply checking the box at the bottom of that application page. You no longer have to upload the signed copy of your declaration of COVID-19 related financial distress. And section D of this application allows you to request rental assistance. You will need to provide at least one form of your landlord's contact information. You'll need to list the rental assistance you owe as well as your, the future rent that you need. Um, and you will need to include utilities assistance here if the landlord is the utility provider. If you are billed by your landlord, even if it comes from a third party source, but you bill, are billed by and pay your landlord directly, um, it is recommended by the state that you put that information here. Um, and that would likely speed up your application process if that is true for your particular circumstances. Um, one thing to note is when you are calculating the amount of rent owed from a rent statement that you received from your landlord, note that any overpayments that you make in a particular month must be applied to the following consecutive month. It cannot be retroactive retroactively applied to previous months without your permission. And then um, there is no longer an option on this section to include late fees, and that is because it is not eligible under the law. Um, it also states that here at the top of the page um, that late fees and penalties are not eligible by law and should not be charged to households experiencing COVID-19 related housing debt. So if you have been charged late fees, feel free to contact us at erapathousing.org and we can try and help you with your particular situation. Um, and also just to note um, on this slide, it, it shows um, August through October is grayed out. However, you can now request rent up to October, 2021. So um, section E regarding prior assistance received um, is where you can note any assistance you've received from other nonprofits, church programs, or um, other housing uh, related resources for rent or utilities assistance. Um, this now includes friends and family, which is something um, that wasn't specified before. However, there's still no option under the drop down section for possible resources or possible sources. Um, if the source of the assistance you received is not listed or you can't remember, you can leave that source blank and it will still allow you to continue with your application and submit this page as complete. Um, supporting documentation about prior assistance received is not required, but we do recommend that you try to fill out this page as accurately as possible to avoid any accusations of fraud for duplicate, uh, duplicate receipt of funds. Um, and one thing about this section is um, I just wanted to address the topic of shadow debt. Shadow debt means um, debt that is incurred through private funds used to pay for rent and utilities. Um, and shadow debt was a big debate among, um, you know, the state uh, stakeholders um, regarding whether or not that should be eligible for rent relief. And I just wanted to confirm that unfortunately it remains ineligible. It was not um, included under a AB 832 as something eligible for rent relief. So if you did receive um, funds to pay for rent and utilities through either credit card advance or from friends and family, it does not count you cannot be repaid for those borrowed private funds. Okay. And I know that um, Isenia did have some interesting input about some of these sections for the application process. And I just wanted to check in if she wanted to um, chime in at all before we move on. No, I just wanted to add that um, child care is a big one. So uh, if there's a household that is working, but um, you know their child care facility has closed, um, they, they should apply if they were impacted in that way. Um, I had another situation come up where um, the tenants actually had foster children move into their home during COVID, their grandchildren and that it, they incurred additional expenses. Um, and so they were also eligible to apply. So all in all, it doesn't hurt to try. 
um, it's already a no. And at worst case scenario, they, some, they, they may be eligible for something. And so navigating these resources is gonna be key. Um, but that's going to lead us to um, the next slide, which covers, um, is it household members or utility assistance? Utilities assistance. Okay, so I'm there's still a place for late fees to be entered in the utility section. And so it's so important that people have a current copy of their outstanding bill. So that way the state can see, or the local program, when who, whatever they apply, can see whatever late fees are being assessed to their, um, their bill. Their bill. Um, and so internet services can be claimed in other utility assistance section. A portion of the tenant's mobile phone services can also be requested, but only if the tenant's Mobile phone is their only source of internet. So costs not related to internet service, such as pay-per-view or cable are not eligible for assistance. So for example, like Xfinity, if you have a package, people are able to go in through the app or get a copy of their bill and show it breakdown. They can highlight it and request that specific amount that's related to the internet. Um, otherwise, if they just send a screenshot of the total, you know, the state may ask for more documentation and that can probably delay it too. All right, I'll give it back to you, Joanne. So the primary household member um, must be identified when you apply and you can click the make primary button that's next to the other household members if you accidentally listed them second. Um, but the primary household member, also known as the head of household, does not need to be the person applying. Any member of the household can apply. Um, minors must be included as household members, but they do not have to enter any employment information, even if they have one. Um, household members include family members, members signed onto the same lease and other residents of the household contributing to the monthly rent payments. But um, as we stated before, co-tenants who ideally would like to have their income considered separate household income do not have to be included here if they plan to submit their own separate application. Um, demographics are optional, except for the relationship to the primary household member um, or the head of household. Um, the head of household, um, the, sorry, the head of household, um, scratch that, um, the race, ethnicity, and gender of the person um, is optional. However, for gender, it will include um, male, female, and non-binary. For section J regarding income, um, one household member over 18 years old or only household members over 18 years old must certify their income. And as stated previously, there are multiple verification options. Um, we stated that you can use your 2020 annual income, you can certify your current monthly income, and you can also use any um, benefit statements of, uh, showing proof that you participate in a state or federal income qualified assistance program. So if the tenants select the second option to um, show that benefit statement, they would still need to state their household's annual income and attest to that amount. Um, and then you would upload that benefit statement to prove that you receive, um, that you receive uh, those benefits. So some examples include um, Medicaid, um, women's infants and children benefits, SNAP um, or food stamps, um, and then the list is all right here for all the other possibilities. So this income section is can be a little bit compli complicated. There's just a lot of different things that you can add to this page. So we just wanted to point out what, what those are. Um, so first is selecting how you would verify your income, which is what we just covered. Um, you can certify by each individual household member, which is essentially for the current monthly income, um, but it can include your 2020 annual income as well if there's multiple people who have um, income to report. This section here is where you would indicate the source of income and you'll see the drop down of what options are possible on the next slide. 
This calculator icon is the calculator that you would need to use in order to report your current monthly income. And we'll recommend the specific ways you can do that on the next slide. Um, documentation, this is where the recommended documents um, or required documents are listed um, as advised by the state. And then number five is where you would include, um, is where you would include uh, your uploaded files. And then number six is what you would press in order to add multiple um, sources of income. So you would add another source again for that same household member. And Asenia, I believe you wanted to take this. Yeah, so this is the other part. So once you've added, um, for example, right here, we've got Jane Doe um, filled out here. Um, so you'll have a, a situation where one person has different sources of income, whether it's child support or they're working part-time and still receiving unemployment benefits. So I think the most critical point here would be to itemize exactly what amount they're receiving from each source. So um, one of the most common ones is cash income. A lot of people work and receive cash, so they can use that calculator tool that Joanne just covered, whether they have a weekly amount or they can average it out or if they have a set monthly amount. Um, and this can be done for each household member. So that calculator tool is very important and the source of income. And it also has the option we can't, well, at least I can't see it here, but um, in the previous slide Joanne just covered, it also says add new. So you can add a new income source as you go filling out the application. Um, or add another file. I think for this one, it says add new source or add another source, I believe. Um, I know for seniors, they'll, you know, some will have a social security and some also receive a pension. So just itemizing it so that way it matches with the documents they're attaching. And I also wanted to add that using the partial year calculator here is highly recommended if you've had, you know, an unstable income or you've been unemployed for part of the year already. So any, you know, um, any offer letter you receive that states your annual income would not be accurate for you since you might not have had income up until March 2021 and then were hired from April onward. So you would use your partial year calculation and then that would actually extrapolate across the remaining months in order to determine what your actual annual income is for this year. If that's too complicated too, and you have a 2020 tax return, you can go that route. Um, it really depends. And as you go filling out the application, it'll give you the options. Thanks, Joanne. No problem. Sorry about that. My computer is having issues. <laughs> okay. So um, section, so section K for supporting paperwork um, requires um, either your proof of legal identity or your lease agreement. But as stated previously, if you've already provided official income documentation, you will not need to provide your proof of legal identity. Um, on this slide, I've selected the answers that would maximize the paperwork required to be uploaded, just so you all could see, you know, what the various questions might be. Um, if you answered that you did not provide income documentation because you claimed cash income or zero income, question K1B would appear in the application. So if you provided income documentation earlier, then you would answer no and further proof of legal identity would not be required. And as stated before, immigration status is not a factor. Um, tenants requested utility assistance and utility statements. Um, if they were requested and uploaded in your name, you would answer yes and you would not need to provide proof of legal identity. And then finally, if the tenant is certain of the landlord's participation and proof of rent owed, um, is going to be supplied by the landlord, then you would not need to provide your lease or rental agreement. Now, Asenia. Yeah, so this is finally the last page I think everyone wants to finally see of the application. And this is um, the part where you submit it 
um, the tenant or the landlord will, well, on the tenant application, they will have to check these three boxes. And so um, providing accurate information, making sure that, you know, they go over and review their application before they submit it um, and agree. I think in one of the checkbox, it says that, um, you know, if the information, if the state needs to verify information, they agree that they can produce that. So making sure that, you know, whatever they upload matches with what they're requesting you. Um, if their water, if they owe water of $1,000, um, you know, the most recent water bill would be the most accurate to upload showing the balance due and any late charges. Um, and then at the left where the arrow is pointing, um, that's only, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Joanne, if someone's assisting with the application. And on the right side, basically, once they check all the boxes that they agree that all the information is true and correct to the best of their knowledge, they're going to sign their first and last name, which is basically serves as their electronic signature. And then they would hit submit. Um, once they submit their uh, state rental application, they're going to get an email from Neighborly Software confirming that, and that's where they'll, they'll see their case ID number. Right, and one thing to highlight about this submission page is that it is a contract between the tenant and the California Department of Housing and Community Development, as well as between the tenant and the landlord. And the same is true, the inverse is true for the landlord application. The landlord uh, submission page is a contract between the landlord and the tenant, as well as the landlord and HCD. So, okay, we will... Um, just quickly go over these final sections since I know we're running out of time. Um, I'll just breeze through it, but you all will have these slides um, to yourselves after the presentation. Um, this is just essentially an overview of the process um, as it goes through the application cycle and how it's reviewed. Um, you'll check your status in the view a continuing an existing application section of your application homepage. Um, and then you will actually be able to see one of these different statuses under that section. And as you can see at section 13 or number 13 is when you are paid. Um, you can see all these definitions in the PowerPoint presentation once it's provided to you. If you do see that you have um, any of these other miscellaneous codes um, 14 through 20, and you have questions or concerns about that, you can reach out to the state's call center directly, or if you need our help, we can try and help determine or figure that out for you. But uh, we are not the state's administrators. We do not distribute funds. Um, Horn LLP is the entity that does that, as well as LISC and um, HCD. They all work together to administer this process. And then finally, we just wanted to give you all the top issues with tenant applications that lead to uh, delays or, um, or to rejections. And then finally, if you need any help um, from either the call center or with another local partner network or our office, here is the relevant contact information um, in the local partner network. The booking center number is how you would reach out and have an appointment scheduled with one of our many local partner networks, including our own. So that's all we have today. Um, thank you so much for having us. And if there's any final questions, we can open it up for anyone to raise their hands or enter that in the chat. I know I've answered some questions in the chat in direct private messages, but if anybody else has questions, please feel free to ask or type it in the chat. What would you say are uh, two things that libraries can do right now to support you guys in this effort? Oh, so. Um, well, Asenia actually also covers San Mateo County, so she can speak to this too, but I know that San Mateo County is training their librarians right now to help with, ed with app which is a great in-person resource since 
everyone knows the library. Yes. Okay, so are you gonna hook us up? <laughs> <laughs> You've already learned it right now. <laughs> Shoot, I'm like, I feel like I just took a mini one unit college course. <laughs> Yes, thanks for I your feedback. I think it's that was great for San Mateo County because they don't have a local program, so everyone's just going to the state. I think the best resource would be to print out the flyer where people can see what program they're eligible for. So the one okay. that shows um, household and income brackets for the local program and the state, and then obviously Project Sentinels flyer. Why not? That would be another good resource. Um, yeah. A lot of landlords, there's not that many agencies that help landlords, and we're one of few. Yeah, that's so, awesome. Call our landlord hotline. I know that we're very busy right now, but they will definitely get a call back from someone from our agency for sure. Cool. And thank you for having us. Great. Yes. If there are no more questions. We really just want to say thank you so much for providing this very comprehensive um presentation about the uh, rent relief program and how you also assist with community members in um, finding relief and support.